Welcome to the Personalized Medicine Podcast. This is the place where scientists, clinicians, and entrepreneurs discuss the progress of this rapidly developing field. I am your host, Alexander Yahensky. Let's start. Three, two, one, and we are live. Welcome to the season two of the Personalized Medicine Podcast. Over the last few months, our team took a break and recharged our batteries. We've received so much motivating feedback from you, so we couldn't just stop at season one. That's why we prepared a new season full of interesting topics, exciting guests, and a few surprises to come along the way. It's great to have you with us again. So let's start the season two together, shall we? Today we are going to revisit a topic with which we started this podcast almost one year ago. We dive deep again into the world of proteomics and are going to focus on translation of proteomic data to biomarker discovery and drug development. I am very excited to welcome on this show Oliver Riner, the co-founder and chief executive officer of Biognosis, one of the leading companies in clinical proteomics. Oliver obtained his PhD from ETH Zurich, where he researched the visual system in zebrafish using behavioral and molecular genetics techniques. He then stayed at ETH to do a postdoc at a group of Professor Rudy Abersold, the pioneer of quantitative mass spectrometry. In 2008, Oliver co-founded Biognosis and has led the company from a university spin-off to one of the market leaders in proteomics. I learned about Biognosis about five years ago when I met Oliver's co-founder, Lucas Reiter, at a conference. I have been closely following their journey and was amazed by the progress that they achieved in such a short period of time. For me, Biognosis is one of the best examples of how basic research can be translated into a viable and exciting business that directly helps developing new personalized therapeutics and diagnostic tests. Oliver, thank you so much for finding time to speak to us. It's a great honor and privilege to welcome you on the podcast. Thank you. Great. I would like to start with your story. What motivated you to start a company based on your research in academia and what were the main milestones that brought you and the entire Biognosis team to the place you are at today? Yeah, so I started Biognosis as a postdoc in the lab of Rudy Ebersold. This is where our company has its root. And um, I would say this environment in Rudy's lab played an important role and shaped the way Biognosis is uh, until today. So Rudy had just come back from the from the US to bring proteomics to Switzerland. So he was building a new group where many smart people uh, who had just started, like me, and that brought an atmosphere of uh, creativity, innovation, and uh, collaboration. So all held together by Rudy's vision of turning proteomics into a quantitative and uh, powerful technology. So that was that was really a great environment uh, to be in. I, I remember it until today and I have many uh, friends in the network from these times. So that was all academic and uh, at the time there weren't many startups in Switzerland. Uh, there was a success story that came from the same institute where where, where, where I was working as a postdoc. It was Kleikart, now Roche, which spun off uh, a company and it was, uh, was a big success. But I remember when I heard about it, I really thought, what is a spin-off? And I had to, <laughs> it was really hard for me to understand uh, what it means to, to to spin off a company from an academic lab. And I was also postdoc, of course, thinking about my next career steps. And that was something that uh, fascinated me. Fascinated me. And I had a co-founder, Johan Malmström, who is now professor in Lund, uh, who had founded a company before, a small company, so that gave a little bit of uh, background and so we were thinking if we should do uh, something in this direction as well. And uh, then we met a very important person for that step. It was Rick Klausner, a quite famous venture capitalist and a physician. 
And uh, then we were discussing with him and uh, explaining him that he didn't really know if he wanted to be scientist or doing something commercial. He said uh, one thing that really triggered my decision and until today really influences me. So he said, the best science I've seen was in small biotech. And that was almost like a revelation for me because it meant that uh, the conflict that I had as a scientist was resolved. Not only could I be a, could I do good science in a commercial background, he said, but no, it meant I would need to be an even better scientist. He would need to do even better science than say 99% of all academic labs. And uh, this has been our ambition from the start and until today. And uh, again, I think it was a really important insight, and I can only 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 say that I believe now that we work with so many companies in in the US and in Europe that is actually to find great science in uh, in certain venture finance uh, startup company but also inside the large pharma company. But then perhaps the next uh, milestones you asked of course we found a company uh, we early early on tried to find customers early adopters uh, that has been key for us as well to, to really test ourselves on the market. And then, of course, you realize that great academic science is a far away still from a commercial technology. But it didn't matter because they had people that were willing to take the risk and willing to try something new, uh, something new knowing that this was early stage. And then, of course, I think I'll say something about this a bit later, the invention of the, of the next generation technology. That, that we have today well, was then a key step for us to, to bring proteomics there today. Perfect. That, that sounds really exciting and, and amazing. And uh, yeah, that, that takes time to get to the, to the point you are at now. Uh, as you mentioned, you, you founded uh, Biognosis now more than 10 years ago. But I think that, that quote that you just said that um, the great science uh, or the best science usually comes from small biotechs is is really revealing uh, and I think for many people in our audience would also probably help them to make uh, their career decision because uh, these are usually PhD students and young postdocs uh, early in their career also looking at different directions where to go uh, further uh, what should be their next career move so thanks a lot for sharing that piece of wisdom with them and uh, maybe let's move a little bit more uh, into the into the applications uh, of what actually Biognosis is doing. So can you um, summarize what are, or what is the main impact of proteomics on pharma industry and how can proteomics help pharma companies develop new therapeutics? Yeah, that's an important question. I think it's a, it's a key question because in the end, if somebody pays us for a product or a service to work with us, they have goals they want to achieve something with us so we need to create value and it's really thinking about how we can create value for our partners that uh, that drives uh, our development now so sometimes it's very easy sometimes the questions are really proteomics question simple example for instance if a company with rna drug uh, uses them they, ex they expect that the uh, rna makes proteins and they want to validate that the proteins are really expressed Sounds like a simple uh, question. There was something like we, we did early on with Moderna, it's public, so that's why I can uh, talk about it. Everybody knows the company now, but at the beginning, uh, they had this technology and, and had to answer the question if the, if the RNA molecules actually produce the protein. For many of those, there were not antibodies available. So um, we gave them a solution to validate their, their compound. It's a very easy example because the question is directly protein related. Yes. Other examples that are directly protein related, like uh, protein degraders, it's an exciting new or, or, or field in, uh, in drug development now, where of course you also want to see in the end the effect on the proteome. And uh, then biomarker discovery, this is probably the main application of a proteomic still, where the question is also directly a protein question, can we identify proteins? That uh, change upon a certain treatment or indicate a certain uh, um, certain condition uh, in a way that is makes them useful as biomarkers. But then you have also a bit more indirectly related uh, questions 
for instance, if you want to understand what is the mode of action of a certain compound. Here, it's sometimes not immediately clear what proteomics can bring, because it's not even clear how such a phenotype can manifest itself on what level, on the RNA level, on the protein level, on the metabolomic level. But you can still, and that's the advantage of proteomics, look at many dimensions. You can look at the phosphorylation, for instance, if you expect that you see pathway regulation, or you look at the protein expression, if you think it's, uh, if, uh, it shows more on the differential expression. Or you do both and you see uh, what gives you most insight. Or you combine this with, for instance, RNA data or DNA data. That's how, how we work with our customers. Sometimes directly relate a very simple question, not always simple to do technically, and sometimes a more open question. Perfect. And then I would actually like to follow up on your last point, uh, especially on biomarker discovery. So uh, a little bit provocative question. Um, what is actually the main value of proteomics over other omics techniques? So let's say in other words, uh, if I'm a manager in the diagnostics or in the pharma company and have very limited financial resources, um, let's say for biomarker discovery, why should I choose proteomics over um, genomics or um, uh, transcriptomics or metabolomics? Okay, there are simple cases. So if people use RNA-seq transcriptomics because they would like to understand what proteins are expressed and they use RNA-seq as a proxy for protein expression. So here you can clearly say, in the meantime, uh, you should directly do proteomics. There's no point in using a proxy if your final question relates to proteins. But it still happens because awareness of uh, what proteomics can deliver today is generally not there yet. So many people still do pro, uh, gene expression because they want to do proteomics. So they should do proteomics directly. Um, in other cases, I would say if it's not clear uh, what the best biomarker is, then I mean, a pot the advantage of proteomics is that it has so many dimensions. You could identify uh, protein modification, the phosphorylation that, uh, of course, is only accessible on the, on the protein level. Or if you identify a protein that's very close to classical biomarker assays, so you can still develop this into an ELISA or stay with a mass spec. So protein-based biomarkers, of course, are widely used. And there's uh, lots of good reasons to, uh, to try to find something on the protein level. But then, I mean, in many cases, it's not either or. It's really a combination of both. So genomics is, of course, not a phenotypic uh, technique, but is closely related to proteomics in that you identify, for instance, mutations, and you want to see how that drives the phenotype on the protein level. Perfect. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I guess, like, as you mentioned, um, in many cases, it makes sense to do a combination of several techniques, depending on what... Uh, is your depending on what is a scientific question you are asking. Let's dive a little bit deeper on interesting technical aspects of mass spectrometry. Can you explain to our audience what is the difference between targeted and discovery proteomics, and what are the typical use cases for each of those in personalized medicine? Good. So I try to be <laughs> to stay on the level that is uh, so that. Um... That, that addresses it on the level for, for all biologists. Yeah. So, uh, so mass spec, that's important to understand, is at the basis of physical method, an instrument that uh, weighs molecules. But it can also isolate ions, funnel them back and forth in the instrument, and thus uh, the fragmentations with them. So that means it's a million different ways how you can use a mass spec. And that's also the reason why you have so many different uh, methods. And it's also one of the reasons why there's so much room for further innovation. Very versatile and the physical method compared to, uh, so for instance, affinity-based methods. Now, so the two main modes you can run that is the targeted versus discovery. So in targeted, uh, you basically know beforehand what you want to analyze. It's like an assay. You can even think of it as a as a as a as an ELISA essay with a with a mass spec because it gives the same answer. 
you know how an analyte looks like, you give it out a method, and then the mass spec focuses specifically only on, on these molecules. Because it can use all its uh, power, let's say, to focus on a few molecules, it can become very sensitive and very, uh, very precise. And that was, in fact, when, uh, when, when Rudy came from the US, there was a big theme that we turned the mass spec into a quantitative tool uh, by focusing it uh, on, on specific peptides. Now, the ambition back then already had been to do this with as many proteins as possible. And uh, you can certainly multiplex it. You can do 50, 100, in the meantime, several hundred uh, uh, peptides. You can look at it. But, and that is the other thing, um, when we reached out to the market, actually went with targeted proteomics to the market, uh, even though we had uh, already things developed for, for discovery, but we went to the market with targeted. We often realized that people, yes, some of them have very clear understanding what targets they want to assay, but others, have a few targets they really want to see, but they also think there could be many, many more. So from the beginning, we realized ideally people would like to see everything. This, of course, makes sense to look at the uh, next gen sequencing. It's also a, a, a complete method, and RNA seq also allows people to look at all the uh, detected genes expressed. And people really, our customers really wanted to ideally see everything. That's why. It didn't stop at the targeted method. We still use that, and it can be very useful if there's a clear question. But the main focus has been on discovery. And uh, the way how mass spec run in most academic labs of the time at the time was actually at this kind of discovery mode called DTA or shotgun proteomics. I could, don't go into <laughs> details why this is called like this. But uh, essentially, it was using the mass spec in a, in a very sequential way. So if you have a complex sample, proteins are digested to peptides, and you have 100,000 of peptides that are injected into mass spec. So there's a lot of, of molecules to analyze. And if you do it sequentially, like it has always been done before we, we invented um, the, the next generation method, then the mass spec picks one molecule, fragments it, then you get a nice spectrum, then it picks the next one, and so on. So of course, the mass spec can never keep up with, them, with the complexity of all the ions that are injected into the mass spec. And this was the reason why shotgun proteomics looked like a shotgun in the end. It gave the patchy, patchy identifications, always just a sample of the, of the proteome. This was driving biologists crazy because uh, imagine you have a protein you're really interested in and you sometimes get it, sometimes not. And uh, that, that was really a disconnect between how the technology was developed in proteomics lab versus what biologists wanted to have. And here really came the significance of the invention of SWAF, uh, it's another abbreviation uh, in, in Rudy's lab, that essentially meant we, so, so we were involved in that and it was really driven by a data analysis uh, point of view that we said, why do we have to isolate single ions? Why can we not fragment them all together? And then, he convolute the data later. And this is what we tried. And in fact, we used targeted proteomics uh, algorithms to, uh, to do that. And uh, we were successful. And it was clear to us, and of course, to Rudy as the, as the first one, that this opened the, the, the way for a very complete, very deep proteomics that at the same time is also very rapid usable. And this is how, now in the meantime, almost all uh, top academic labs are also running. Uh, discovery proteomics, you, uh, you don't do shotgun proteomics anymore, except for very specific applications. You try to isolate all the ions that are injected into the mass spec and be convoluted and have a complete, complete data set. What that means in the end, we can see, even HeLa, we have shown uh, 10,000 proteins in a single injection, and the tissues, we can even go higher, and uh, there's no need for fractions. For fractionation anymore before people were also fractionating sample because of the sequential method certainly needs more time so you make more fractions this is all not necessary anymore you can have a single check in two three hours and see many thousand uh, proteins you can quantify them there's very little uh, missing data and that's all based on that uh, initial invention from 2012 i believe perfect that sounds uh, really fantastic and 
to see also how fast um, SWOT was adopted, I think, in the scientific community is also amazing. Uh, it just took several years uh, before this relatively complex technology was spread around the world and is now changing the, the face of biomarker discovery. So maybe you can just elaborate a little bit more on what actually uh, the SWOT technology can mean for personalized medicine and for, for biomarker discovery. Um, why uh, is it so important and uh, what um, value it adds in comparison to the traditional shotgun proteomics? Yeah, of course, personalized medicine is still in its uh, early stages. Even if you look at the genomics, so you think when it's established, you, you realize foundation medicine has panels, but uh, the whole wealth of information that you get from genomics is only starts start, start to be used in personalized medicine. So also proteomics has uh, still some, some way to go, but there are some exciting pioneers that use uh, proteomics. Uh, so uh, discovery proteomics PIA uh, for personalized medicine, for example, the company uh, Renome uh, in San Francisco or West Coast company that tries to get an omics view actually on the genomics on the proteomics uh, to to develop with the help of AI uh, new ways to, to to for diagnostic for early detection of cancer, and that's an exciting. Uh, approach very innovative, and then is the company I would say that uh, that is most advanced in uh, in using proteomics for precision medicine is the company in VivoMed, the company we, we we work with is also public, so they have a huge database of uh, of cancer tissues where they do very deep genomics, transcriptomics proteomics on the protein expression and the phosphoprotein level. So that's probably the, the most systematic and deepest, uh, so deepest approach, really trying to use the whole wealth of information from all these omics methods. But then of course, for if you then go to biomarker discovery, uh, it's a bit more straightforward because that's the way that you can see very deep and see many proteins and can see them very reproducible. Uh, helps a lot in uh, in identifying interesting biomarkers, but also at, uh, giving the statistical power that you need to really qualify them as uh, as good biomarkers. That was hard when proteomics was not so deep before, uh, when you were always just seeing the most abundant proteins. Now that you can reach very very deep, you of course start to see exciting new proteins that uh, potentially are much better biomarkers than the yeah the protein. Yeah, that's that's great to hear, and uh, I, I'm really happy that there is a, a lot of progress in in this field, and uh, many more companies are stepping into biomarker discovery and bringing it even like next step further to to personalized medicine. And you mentioned uh, in your um, in your last answer AI, and I know that at Biognosis you're also using uh, AI and machine learning to uh, develop um, algorithms that would help analyze uh, that vast proteomic data. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Uh, how can machine learning and AI be leveraged in proteomics and what is the main value of it? Yeah, of course, on the, on the signal processing uh, level, we use AI now, that's the deepest level. It's very important still because you can still go deeper and deeper by better uh, algorithms. Um, so, the prediction of peptide fragmentation, or when they elude from a column, seems to be an ideal application for artificial intelligence for neural, for neural networks, actually. Because, the, of course, it's a physical principle that determines how peptides fragment, but it has been impossible to predict by, say, um, by physical models. But it's clear that it has to do with amino acids uh, next to each other, but it's not a linear problem. But uh, it's very powerful, and you can always perfectly predict the uh, uh, peptide spectra for with the AI now and we use that in our search engines that are uh, embedded in our software. And that has very interesting implications because we could now think about predicting peptide modifications especially that no one has seen before that you hy can hypothesize that they are there and then discover them. So before you always needed to have uh, say evidence be a peptide once, 
uh, or make a synthetic peptide. Uh, then you know how it looks like. You can look for it in the data. Now you can think about looking directly in the data just by predicting it. And that can open uh, the new biology of protein modification study. Perfect. And uh, what I also would like to discuss with you today, uh, essentially, what are the main challenges of bringing proteomics to, to clinics and close it to patient? Um, as you mentioned already, there has been an explosion uh, of um, proteomics applications in the research uh, and in uh, pharma R&D, but how can we really make proteomics a mainstream uh, method in uh, clinical diagnostics and then uh, also perhaps in patient certification and the clinical uh, trials. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you see the same with next gen sequencing. The relevance of the technology is largely also uh, driven by the, 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 by, by the idea to use it in a clinical setting. And uh, we want to do this as well. And at the moment, we're developing a discovery proteomics for use under GCP. GCP is, uh, is, a, is a framework, a quality framework that we need to work with patient samples. We had a publication with a, or a presentation with Roche at the MSACL in 2019, where we showed how this complex discovery proteomics technology can be run under GCP like a pharma sponsor would want to have it to use it for a clinical trial sample. So that was a big milestone for us. And from there on, we, uh, we, we set out to, to develop this quality uh, framework. And now we are able to, to offer this under GCP. So we are pioneers really in bringing this to clinical trial use. So that's the first step. Uh, if you think about how to, um, how to bring then proteomics even closer to clinical decision making. So First, I think going by the clinical trials, it's a logical path forward. But then, of course, we also see um, doctors using already in the tumor boards, for instance, uh, genomics data that is not validated yet as an in vitro diagnostic, but they can still use the evidence to, to make decisions because, uh, like mutations, for instance, can be actionable inside. And I think that's also a way forward for proteomics how we can closer get the bring proteomics closer to clinical decision making. So again, it helps to look at the, at the genomics world. We have foundation medicine and, and, and others like new new oncology, for instance, that do have panels uh, as in vitro diagnostic or companion diagnostic. But then you have the whole next gen sequencing uh, that in the research field that does so much more, right? And still not uh, formally used for clinical decision making. So it takes time. It has also to do with the way how decision making works, with reimbursement. Let's do a lot with this. But I think uh, that genomics can be a trailblazer, really prepare the field for the use of, uh, of other omics, specifically proteomics for clinical decision making, because it's more that change in the um, mindset that you move away from single markers, single diagnostics to, um, to multiplex diagnostics that that uh, is, is both for the genomics and the proteomics. Yeah, you are right. I think it took uh, quite some time genomics to actually enter clinical uh, applications. So it's almost twenty years now since we sequenced the first uh, human genome, uh, and now the first genetic based tests are getting um, reimbursed and getting recognized by the healthcare system as a valuable um, diagnostic uh, technique and. Uh, yeah, probably proteomics will, will follow after that. One of the perceived bottlenecks for clinical applications of mass spectrometry is high complexity and relatively poor reproducibility of the measurements. Is it really still the case today? And what can be done to improve reproducibility and user friendliness of mass spec? Yeah, it's uh... This is, of course, a, a legacy perception that is around for good reasons. So I would say people that don't follow the latest developments in proteomics, the good chance that they think it's complicated and uh, irreproducible because it was in the past and in, in the early days. And uh, this is something that is a challenge that we need to overcome from the, of course, from validating the technology, showing, publishing, 
what proteomics can do today because in reality it's actually highly reproducible now and with very low CVs. And it has to do with, uh, of course, uh, improvement of sample preparation, automation, and robotics can play an important role there. It has to do with much more stable chromatography. And, uh, of course, moving from, a, say, this random shotgun method to a non-random um, uh, DIA method that all help to, to make it uh, very reproducible in the hands of experts. And that remains uh, a challenge as well. So, of course, if people work with us and, uh, and we do services for them, then we have everything under control. We can provide this in a high reproducible way. If some clinic says, now I want to do my proteomics myself and buy some mass spec, then there's a good chance that they will initially struggle a lot to, uh, <laughs> to get this running because it's still a highly complex instrument. The whole workflows around it are not standardized at all. I think we can expect that certain, I mean, see already companies that work in the standardization, for instance, of the sample prep, offer solutions in robots that do almost the sample prep automatically. We have companies like um, uh, companies that uh, offer more standardized uh, chromatography columns. So all of this will help that the uh, proteomics becomes say, simpler, more reproducible, also in the hand of uh, non experts I think we are the transition at the moment where it becomes simpler, but it still has high complexity. And of course, it's always like it's like in Formula One, right? So if you want to go to the outer limit of, uh, of uh, performance, this will always uh, require a lot of expertise. But that is not required for everybody to, to see 10,000 proteins, right? So if the ambition is a bit lower. I think already now it's much easier than a few years ago to set this up in a clinical lab, for instance. Perfect. I, I love this analogy, and I, I think it's really important to have uh, a few Formula One players like Biognosis uh, in that field just to push the boundaries and uh, always challenge uh, what is possible and kind of expand uh, the limit of um, the technical limits of, of the technology. And uh, I'm really happy to hear that um, essentially this method is getting more and more robust uh, and uh, um, it's probably just the perception that remains uh, of MASPEC as not the mo as probably like the very scary and challenging methods for outsider and uh, something that that is hard to understand and hard to reproduce. I would like now to discuss the future with you a little bit. So, what do you expect the main developments in the proteomics to be in the next, let's say, five to ten years? And uh, Perhaps also you could give advice to, to some of our uh, listeners who are PhD students and postdocs. What are the hot fields uh, that you expect to develop further or explode in proteomics in the next five, 10 years, perhaps uh, where these people can uh, go for and do their postdoc? <laughs> it's, of course, very hard because you can almost be sure that your predictions are an extrapolation of the present and uh, may not be the reality, right? But I still can say what I, I find um, uh, as exciting emerging fields. So, um, um, but what I mentioned before, I think there's a lot to learn. We, we know still very little about the proteome, about uh, how proteins are modified and what biological relevance this has. That is, uh, that is a field where I, I think we will get much more insights and, uh, and definitely worth uh, looking at not only phosphorylation. Then it's a structural, the structural dimension. We haven't talked about this yet, but you can use the mass spec also now as a say, low resolution structural tool. And this has a, in the lab of the episode where I work, uh, I work actually on protein cross-linking. That's something we don't do commercially yet, but uh, it has already produced quite a number of uh, nature and cell paper where using cross-linking mass spectrometry really and able to give uh, structural insights that were in combination with the cryo EM, for instance, were not possible to get. The structure is, of course, uh, extremely relevant. And now with, uh, with the development of this limited proteolysis from, from uh, uh, Paula Picotti, who was also postdoc in this lab at the time, but is now a professor at ETH Zurich. So she, she developed a way to, uh, to identify changes in, um, in, in, in Proteolytic patterns 
that you can pick up with a mass stack that tells you how a protein changes. We license this technology and use this to for drug parity convolution. Um, so finding out in the whole protein which proteins change the structure, which points then to binding with the compound. But you can uh, go beyond that, and as you already showed, uh, evidence that you can think of the of the proteome activity also happening on a structural level, right? Not only looking at phosphorylation, a phosphorylation changes how protein interacts and has also changes sometimes their structure. So the looking at the, the proteome structure as a new dimension, that for me in very exciting field and uh, just just the beginning. And the technology is so uh, it's not easy to do, but it's emerging. So using the mass spec as a structure biology large scale tool, this is an exciting field. But what I, what I also think is uh, is extremely important, uh, and it's a hard one, is uh, something you could call, the, um, say, psychoomics. That is the hard question: how to turn data into knowledge. And this is, of course, not only a proteomics question, but in the end, I believe that will impact or, or, or decide about the impact of, uh, of omics, how we manage to translate it in a way that it works with the human brain. But people don't like black boxes. If you look how decisions make the decision, also they need framework of, of cognitive framework, how they can place their mutations in the end and, and the data. And a black box that tells you do this or do that, I don't think that will work. People need to to have the feeling of understanding of knowledge. And it's a hard question how to achieve it. I think it's a mixture of psychology and data science. And uh, if somebody wants to do something real useful uh, and uh, in the interdisciplinary way, this is something I would, I would look at. That sounds very interesting. And uh, yeah, for me also very new, uh, kind of applying a mass spec to to solve problems in the structural biology uh, and also the psychomics uh, sounds very exciting. And uh, I don't know if this term is official, but uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, but but uh, but it makes a lot of sense. And uh, I think there is a lot of stuff to dig in uh, there for sure. Perfect. And Oliver, as you mentioned in the beginning of, of this interview, um, you came to entrepreneurship from academia and uh, you're also not very certain in the beginning whether it was the right choice uh, or not. So perhaps you can share some advice with, um, with our audience uh, and uh, tell them what should they consider uh, if, uh, if they are thinking about switching from academia to entrepreneurship, uh, starting their own company or joining a biotech startup? Well, also here, right, one advice is to to listen to other people, but then make your own decisions. And if you think you need to do it differently to what everybody says, if it's not about legal or corporate governance, there is no flexibility, then, uh, then you should do that. But what was important for me and what I actually also see with uh, other companies, so I know now, a lot of startup companies, so I, I take a bit of a broader view, is uh, but the team. That's very important. You can't do it alone. You need a team. Don't need to be necessarily friends. Sometimes it's better if it's not friends or not family. Actually, I would not involve family. That's not wise. I never did, and I'm, I'm glad I didn't. But you need a team. And it is important to not incorporate too early before you have the team in place. So if you can, and I think the most of the tech transfers allow you to get a right on licenses. You would need that to wait until you have the team complete. And from the structure of the team, or at least have a strong core team. Um, where you shouldn't compromise is on the, on the ethics. I think you need to be 100% aligned on, on, on your ethics, how you want to work together, what is important for you. But then, of course, you should have as much diversity as possible in terms of personality and skills. But this is very important that you are aligned on, on the basic understanding how you want to work with your customers among each other, what you want to tell the world and uh, where your boundaries are. And then what worked for us uh, was also super important that we went to the market early. I mean, in hindsight, <laughs> I mean, 
going out telling people, hey, do you want to work with us with a very immature technology? Uh, look, yeah, almost a bit naive, but it was the right thing to do. And actually, it's the way if I look at the American companies that do this all the time. And it's a good thing to do. You need to, you need to sell. You need to try to find customers or partners that want to work with you because that really gives you a completely new perspective and will make sure that you, that, yeah, that you develop things so that they can impact uh, someone else so that they have a value on the market. This I would also always try early. You can't lose really and you learn a lot. Yeah, I subscribe under each word of that uh, answer. Uh, I think all, everything that you mentioned is extremely important. Uh, starting with the last point, going to market early. I think one needs to understand what are the true market needs because sometimes as, as scientists, we might think, yeah, that's a great technology and everybody would lo- would want to use it. But in reality, um, your customers uh, might have completely different problems and, and your tech might not necessarily help them. And kind of getting that early feedback and understanding what their true needs are is, is very important. Um, and also what you mentioned on never compromising on ethics, I think it's that's true probably not just for entrepreneurship, but for, for, for every aspect of life. Uh, and uh, I couldn't agree more with you on that. Perfect. Oliver, it was a great interview. I learned a ton and I'm sure our audience did as well. In case um, our listeners would like to reach out, how can they find you online? Um, you can reach out to me directly, so it's easy. It's oliver.fenner at biognosis.com or reach out to, uh, to us via the webpage. So I'm always happy to, to help if I can. And of course, if you want to work with us, uh, you, you can find us there. Perfect. Uh, Oliver, thank you very much for, for joining us today for this interview, for the first episode of season two of the Personalized Medicine podcast. Um, and I wish you all the best for the future to you and your company. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for being with us today on the Personalized Medicine Podcast. If you like this show and know someone who would enjoy it too, please share this podcast with them. And don't miss the next episode yourself. Subscribe to the Personalized Medicine Podcast on your favorite podcasting app. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Pocket Casts, Stitcher, iHeartRadio and many, many more. Please rate us there and leave a comment. That helps us to grow and deliver the best experience to you. To access the show notes for this episode, visit our website, pmedcast.com. It's P-M-E-D-C-A-S-T dot com. And engage with us on social media, where we regularly share the news and exciting content on personalized medicine. You can find us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Facebook just by typing in Personalized Medicine Podcast. Or use our handle, pmedcast. And if you have any feedback or would like to suggest a guest for the show, write us an email to team at pmedcast.com. Have a great day and until next time.